Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat in which we would look at the industry analysis and how it applies to security analysis. As always, I would like to remind you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to my YouTube where I have close now to 2000 YouTube accounting, auditing, tax, finance, as well as Excel tutorials. If you like my lectures, please like them and share them. On my website, farhatlectures.com, you will find additional resources to complement this course as well as other courses. Please check out my website. So why do we have industry analysis? Why do we have to do industry analysis? Just like what we did with macroeconomics factor, we have to look at the industry factors as well. First, we look at the international environment, at then macroeconomics, then we can look at the industry when we are doing security analysis. So it is difficult for an industry to perform well when the macro economy is, is failing. It's also unusual for a firm in a travel industry to perform well. So, so after we look at the macro economy, not all industries perform this, the same way. Let's assume the macro economy is doing well, then we still have to look at a specific industry. Just we have just we just as we looked at international economics, we're in different countries the economy is performing differently industries varies the same way for example here here we have return on equity for certain industries and this is march 2007 if we notice iron and steel the return the return on equity it's the profit that the investors get based on net income based on accounting figure notice it's almost i would say one percent versus the aerospace it's uh, i would say 25 percent broadcasting you know, around 24%, so on and so forth. So not all industries perform the same way. Same thing with the stock market return. Given the wide variation, variation in profitability because they have different return, different net income, well, guess what? Their stock will perform also, will have different performance across industries. For example, airline, this is again, June 8th, 2017. The, 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 uh, the industry grew at a little bit more than, I would say, 40%. That's the industry stock price performance. But this is not for a particular company. This is for the whole industry. But, but that's still pretty good. If we look on the other, on the other side, integrated oil and gas, they, were, they, ha they have a negative performance. So yes, indeed, studying the industry is important. So uh, more likely, if you invest in the airline, in, a, in an airline company, most likely you're going to perform well versus an integrated oil and gas, it's, it's not performing as well. So the spread in performance across industries is remarkable, ranging from 40.9 to an 8.4 loss in the oil and gas industry. And we have in between. Again, this is from June 8, 2017. So the fact that in, in this year, 20 of the 22 industries, notice all of them has all of them the majority which is 20 out of the 22 show positive return this show the systematic or the market the market factors it means when one industry is when 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 the economy is doing well usually all industries do well but not at the same rate here's basically those are i mean relative they're not as as big as the other ones so so guess what so what you can do is one can invest with an industry focused fund like fidelity they offer more than 40 sector funds so basically you'll buy the mutual fund and what you do is you select one industry and you don't have to worry about the performance of any particular company now you the 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 return of the fund is based on the industry overall now having said so even even within each industry you're going to have different performance for companies for example here we're looking at the application uh, software firms this is the return on equity notice most of them are doing well like Intuit, Oracle, Citrix, SAP, Microsoft, Adobe, except for example, uh, Cinematic, negative 6.6. .6. So overall, I would say if you if, if you if you invested in the software application industry, you should be fine. But if you selected that particular company, Semantic, Semantic to be more specific, then you're going to have a negative return on equity. And this is a return on equity. I don't know what, what their stocks is doing, but I can assure you if your return on equity is 61.6 for Intuit, the stock should be doing fairly well. Now, how do we do this, this analysis? Because it can be difficult to determine in what industry a company falls. I mean, it's hard to draw the line between uh, one industry and another. So a useful way to define industry group is given by the North American industry classification system. These codes are assigned to groups, uh, to group firm for statistical analysis. So we do have a way, and this is how we computed those figures. We have specific industries. For example, the code for construction is 23. Okay. 
So code starting with 236, donate building construction. So 236, the, all of these are, notice, 236. 236 is uh, building construction. 2361, when you add the one to it, it's residential construction. And 236115, 6115, it's single family construction. So we have specific code for different industries. So the first five digits are common ac across all NAFTA countries, the US, uh, Canada, and America, uh, US, Canada, and US, Mexico, and Canada. The six digit is country specific and allow for a finer partition of industry. Uh, of industry. So this, once you get to the six digit, this is based on the country. So firm with the same four digit codes are commonly taken to be to be in the same industry. So basically, if you're looking at again, two, three, six, um, two, three, six, and another figure, it's basically the same industry, the same industry. So two, three, six, one here. Notice two, three, six, one. And this is 2362, which is non-residential, commercial, non-residential building. So this is how they collect all this data. Now, the best way to illustrate this is to look at uh, just an, not an extreme example, but a good point to illustrate the point of why selecting an industry is important in your security analysis. Let's assume we're looking at a grocery store or a grocery company or a jewelry company. OK, so they're not all equally sensitive to the business cycles. Remember, we talked about the business cycle in the prior session. So if we look at the jewelry and the grocery, and hopefully you would know right away that in good time, when the company is expanding, the jewelry company, they will do very well. And in bad time, they don't do as well. But the grocery store, if you notice in blue, it's it kind of it stays the same from 1993 to 2007. If you, the, the average is like, you know, almost the same. OK, versus the jewelry store, it goes up and down. Clearly, sales of jewelry, which is a luxury item, fluctuate more widely than those of the grocery. Notice it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And what does it go with? It goes with the, with the economy. Jewelry sales jump in 1999 during the dot com boom, but fell in 2001 when we had the recession. In contrast, sales growth in grocery industry is relatively stable it does not matter whether we have a recession and sometimes the recession do help more because people eat homes therefore they buy more gro more grocery um, or if we are experiencing an expansion these patterns reflect the fact that jewelry is a discretionary good item whereas most grocery product are staples for which demand will not fall significantly even in hard times even in hard times it might even be better but to determine how sensitive an industry um, to the stock market or to the whole economy, we examine three factors that affect their earnings. One is their, their sensitivity to sales, two is operating leverage, and three is the financial leverage. And we're going to look at each one of them separately, starting with sensitivity of sales. Well, if you're selling goods, goods that are considered necessities like food, medical equipment, show little sensitivity to business condition. It doesn't matter. You know, groups such as food, drugs, and medical services, they are not affected as much. I'm not saying they're not affected. They're not affected as much. For example, you may defer an elective surgery. But if you have to have a surgery, you're not going to wait. Okay? Other industries with low sensitivity are those for which income is not crucial determinant to demand. Like what? Tobacco product are examples of this type of industry. Substitute. An substitute. Another industry in this group is movies. For example, Netflix. Consumers tend to substitute movies for more expensive source of entertainment when income levels are low. For example, a lot of people, they canceled their cable because it's around $70 and they substituted with Netflix, $14 a month. <clears throat> in contrast, firm and industries such as machine tools, steel, autos, and transportation are highly sensitive to the state of the economy. For example, you know, sales, um, uh, auto sales was declining. The past now we're in October, we're like the sixth month into COVID. Sales uh, of auto slowed down, slowed down, right? Because we can defer, we can wait. It's a big ticket item. So these industries are sensitive more to sales versus Netflix subscribers went up. Operating leverage. What's operating leverage? It's the division between your fixed and variable income. So when you operate your business, do you have more of fixed income or more of variable of variable cost, not f 
fixed income, fixed costs and variable costs. Fixed costs are those that are incurred regardless of its production level. Fixed costs, basically you have this cost, you cannot get rid of it, whether you have a million dollar of sales or no sales. Variable costs are costs that rise and fall as the firm produce more or less product. Variable costs, you only incur variable costs when you need to produce something. So if you don't produce it, you don't have that variable cost. So profit of firms with a greater variable cost as opposed to fixed cost will be less sensitive to business condition. Think of software company. If you have a software company and you have a slowdown in business, guess what? You simply lay off your employees and you no longer have expenses because your employees, your software engineers are your biggest cost. Therefore, you don't have any expenses. And let's assume you, you subscribe to a, a specific particular software. You just cancel your subscription. So it's very easy. Why? Because your cost is variable. Well, if you have two, three contracts, big contracts, you would rehire your employees, you would activate your subscription, and you're back into business. So your, your, uh, your cost is variable. You can easily reduce it. In economic downturn, these firm can reduce cost as output fall in response to falling sales. V very easy. Same thing with the law firm. Okay, why? You just lay off your employees and you're good to go. Profit for firms with high fixed costs, think of the auto industry will, or the airline company will swing more widely with sales because costs do not offset revenue variability. Think of airline companies. Let's assume we, uh, the, the, the company, you know, they have two trips every day from New York to California, and from California to New York, then you're one in the, one in the a.m. and one in the p.m. Regardless of whether the economy is doing well or not, whether the demand is up or high, their cost is practically most of their cost is fixed. OK, but what's the good thing about fixed cost? The good thing about fixed cost is once you reach, let's assume your fixed cost is for every trip, your fixed cost is uh, $10,000 for the sake of illustration. So what happened is. And this is zero. So what happened is if you have a fixed, if you have to cover, let's assume an airline company, the trip has a fixed cost of $10,000. Once they cross this fixed cost, once they, once they cover the fixed cost, everything else above the fixed cost is profit, 100% profit. But the key is to jump over this hurdle. The difference with the, with the variable cost, okay? So variable cost, if you want to make a dollar of profit, you have to incur maybe 60 cent of cost. If you want to make another dollar, you have to incur 60 cents per cost. So the cost will stay with you. As you make profit, you have more cost. But at the same time, if you have no sales, you don't have to incur the cost. For industries with high fixed cost, they have the cost up front. There is nothing they can do about it. In good times, guess what? In good times, that you know they may make you know $300,000 profit in one trip. Why? Because once they cover the fixed cost, every additional customer is pure profit. Okay, that's 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 the pro and the con of fixed costs. And we're gonna talk about this in a moment in the next on the next slide when we talk about financial leverage. These firms are said to have high operating leverage as small swings in business condition can have a large impact of profitability. So simply put, unless you unless you reach the ten thousand, you are at a loss. Once you go above that ten thousand dollar, everything else is practically one hundred percent gain, unquote one hundred percent. Financial leverage is something very similar to the operating leverage. They know this. They go, they both were to use leverage. And what is leverage? Basically, when we say operating or financial, what is leverage? Leverage, it's using something else. You're levering something else. Here, you're, lev you're levering, leveraging your debt. You're using other people's money. You're using other people's money to lever, to help you, uh, to propel you, to lever you. So interest payment on that must be paid regardless of sales. So basically, this is we're talking about fixed cost. So interest cost is a fixed cost, but it, but interest cost we deal with it separately because it's very important to pay your bank. Otherwise, you will go out of business. It's as simple as that. So these are fixed costs that also increase in the sensitivity of profit to business condition. Same thing. If you have a loan, the first thing you have to do is you have to cover your cost of that loan before you make any profit. Therefore, if you have a high leverage, well, you're going to have to have, and, and the economy go down, goes down south, you're going to be in trouble. So investors should not always prefer industries with lower sensitivity to the business cycle. Why? Well, it all depends on your risk, but why not? Firms in sensitive industries will have high beta stocks and are obviously riskier. That's good. But while they swing lower in downturn, they also swing higher in upturn. So it's all about the key is how much risk you are expecting to uh, to hold 
for compensating how much are you what's your risk tolerance this is basically what it, it goes down to the key is whether the expected return on the investment is fair compensation for the risk rotation what is sector rotation is the shift of portfolio more heavily into the industry or sector groups that are expected to outperform based on one assessment of the state of the business cycle so not all industries perform the same in F, in any business cycle notice we go up, we reach a peak, we contract, we go down, we reach a trough, then we expand again, we reach a peak up and down. Now, not all companies perform the same in those changes. So what's going to happen is this. If you know, if you know you are at a peak and you're going to go through a contraction, so let's start from there. You want to switch back to defensive companies like healthcare. So once you're at the, once you know we reached the peak, now we're gonna go down, you wanna buy consumer stable, utilities, financial, and at the end of the contraction, at the end of the contraction, once we know, once you know we reached the trough, you wanna start to buy financials and technology. Then you will go into consumer discretionary, like a jewelry, right? <laughs> Materials, you know, up, up industries, industrial, energy then we reach the peak again once we reach the peak again then the process this wheel would repeat itself now the key is to determine when at what point we are at a peak now we know that after the fact the key is to know this here not know it here or here the key is to know ahead of time when did we reach the peak in the economy because if we know we reached a peak then we have a sector rotation you would start to sell the energy the industrial the consumer discretionary and you will start to buy defensive and you will do the opposite at the trough level now we have what's called the industry life cycle each industry goes through a life cycle and there are the there are the four life cycles startup consolidation maturity and relative decline and we're going to take a look at them and explain them in terms of how what what's their sales because what's important is this you make sales eventually hopefully you will make it doesn't mean you're going to make profit but the assumption is you make profit so the more sales you make the more profit you make the more the higher is your stock so what happened in the startup stage what is a startup stage the early stages of an industry are often characterized by new technology or product Think of the desktop personal computers in the 80s or the cell phone in the 1990s or the large screen smartphone introduced in 2007. So let's talk about PCs. In the 80s, PCs were in the startup stage. What do we experience through the startup stage? At this stage, it's difficult to predict which firm would emerge a leader because you're going to have many firms competing for the same technology. Some firms will, will turn out to be wildly successful and others will fail together. Just like with when the dot com. We had so many companies like Amazon, like Yahoo. Well, Yahoo is not really a successful story, nor eBay, but Amazon. Amazon was was in the startup stages in, in 99, 2000. But you don't know whether Amazon's going to survive or not. But if you did buy Amazon, well, people made a lot of money buying Amazon. Therefore, there's a considerable risk in selecting one particular firm within the industry. Or think of Tesla these days. This is where Tesla is. It's basically a startup startup for example in the smartphone industry there continues to be a battle among c competing technologies such as un androids and the iphone i would say they're no longer in a startup stage um, i would say but you can yeah you know depending on how you look at it maybe they're at the end of the startup stage or they're in a stable growth it's up yeah, it's up to you how you define it at the industry level it's clear that sales and earning will grow at an extremely rapid rate when the new product has not yet saturated the market so think about it when not everybody had a phone for example in 2000 very few household had smartphone altogether not even you know uh, but now it's it's totally different the potential market for the product was huge because eventually you would assume everyone will have a smartphone just like if you think tesla if you think everybody's going to be driving a tesla 15 years from now it's time to buy Tesla if that's what you believe, but we're going to look at other factors. In contrast, consider the market for mature product like refrigerator. Well, practically, not practically, everyone, every U.S. household has a refrigerator. Okay, almost all in the U.S. already have refrigerator. So the market for this good is primarily composed of household replacing old ones, which is obviously limit the potential of growth. Okay, so this is in the rapid increasing growth. Then we move to the stable growth. After a product becomes established, industry leader began to emerge. You know, for example, in 2015, Apple and Samsung basically they combined, they, 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 they control this, they control the the smartphone market. So the survival from the startup stages are more stable. Some people don't make it through the 
through the through the stable uh, stable growth. Here, what we have is consolidation. Here, what we have is consolidation, and the performance of the surviving company will more likely track the performance of the overall industry. Here, what they do is consolidation means they will start to buy each other. They will start to buy smaller smaller firms that could not compete or it's easy to buy them to get them out of the competition. The industry will still grow faster than the rest of the economy as the product pen penetrate the market and becomes more commonly used. You still have growth in this, uh, in, this, in this stage, in the consolidation stage. In the maturity stage, now it, the, 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 the growth will start to slow down. The product has reached its, its potential for use by customers. Practically now, not practically, the majority of people have smartphones. I still know people that still have a flip phones, but the majority of people will have a smartphone. Further growth might merely track growth in the general economy. Now you're just basically you're going to do as good as the economy. The product has become far more standardized and the producer are forced to compete to a greater extent on the basis of price. Now, the time frame, the time frame, this is for each company and for each industry is, is different. For example, this could be three years. This could stage could be five years. This could be two years. This could be five years. Slowing growth could be 10 years, could be 15 years. So there's no time limit. You don't, you, we don't know that until after the fact. And because you're competing on price, you start to make lower profit and further pressure on the profit. You have to put pressure on the profit. Firm at this stage sometimes are characterized as cash cows. They're bringing the cash and now they can pay out to their shareholders and bondholders, providing reasonably stable cash, but offering little opportunity for profit expansion. The cash flow is best milked from rather than reinvested in the company. So basically now the investors want their money. They want the dividend. Why? Unless you have a new product, we'll go back to here. I'm better off having the money in my pocket. So that's why it's called cash cow. Okay. For example, personal computers by the mid 1990s, it was a mature industry with a high market penetration, considerable price competition, low profit margin and slowing sales. Just another example, Microsoft, it did not pay dividend until 2005. Why? Because from the year 2000 till the, till the year 2005, they reached this stage here and investors started to demand like, look, you have a lot of cash on hand. You really don't have a new product. Start to pay us dividend. At this stage, the company will be a cash cow. Cash cow means milk the cash out of it in, in terms of dividend. By the mid 1990s, desktops were progressively given up, given up to laptops, indeed, which were in their early startup stages. Then what happened to laptop? Within a dozen of years, laptop had in turn entered a maturity stage again low profit margin and new competition from tablets and large screen smartphone. Then eventually something's gonna come and replace tablet and large screen smartphones. So notice we have this cycle again and again and again, one product replacing the other one, or one in product within the industry replacing each other. And once we get to the relative decline in this stage, the industry might grow at a less then the over, on the rate of the overall economy, or it might even start to shrink. Again, how long it takes, this could take 20 years, this could take three years, but definitely the industry life cycle is getting shorter and shorter because of technology, because of technology. This could be due to obsolescence of the product, competition from new product or competition from new low cost supplier. Consider, for example, again, the displacement of desktop by laptop. It happened very quickly. Then laptops are technically not obsolete, but they're being replaced by uh, tablets and smartphones. Okay. So the question is at which stage in life cycle are investments in an industry more attractive? So what do you think? That, that's the question. Some people think it's at the startup stage. Well, if it's at the startup stage, there's a risk you may not make it to the consolidation stage. Or once you know you are make you, you are in the stable growth, well you missed all this growth, and you don't know what's going to happen. You know how how much slower the growth is going to be, and if you're in the slowing growth, you missed all all of these. But now you are more secure. So it all depends on your risk tolerance. It all depends on your risk tolerance. So think of Tesla. Think of Tesla. What where do you think Tesla is? Do you think it's still here? Do you think Tesla here or do you think Tesla in this stage is at startup, consolidation or maturity? Okay, it's definitely not in relative decline, but think of Tesla also, the technology could change very fast because Tesla has competition. 
They did not really start to produce as a large, at a large scales, but all auto industries are going into this industry. Also, who knows, we might have some new technology, fuel cell, or I'm, I'm not sure, some technology that we, don't, we never heard of. It's more efficient, cheaper, and better than what we have right now, better than the battery. So we don't know. But the point is, you're taking a risk at any stage. You invest, you just need to understand your risk and how much risk you are willing to bear. And as always, I would like to remind you to like this recording, share it, and visit. please visit my website, farhatlectures.com, for additional resources. Good luck, stay safe, and study hard.